Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Leo Laporte, because that's me. This is Triangulation, episode 100, recorded April 24th, 2013. Mitch Kapor. Welcome to Triangulation, the show where I get to interview some of the most interesting people in technology. Episode 100, that means we have 99 great interviews, but I'm so glad to have this fella for our 100th, Mitch Kapor is here, and it's a name that anybody who follows technology knows. Mitch, of course, the founder uh, and designer of Lotus123, the spreadsheet, the first spreadsheet on the PC that changed everything for IBM. Uh, he then went on to found the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, served uh, on the Mozilla board, uh, is, a, you know, become an open source advocate, is an inspiration for us all. It's great to talk to you, Mitch. Thanks for joining us on Triangle. Nice to be here. We have something in common. You yes. were you were music director and program director at WYBC in New Haven. That is so true. So was I. Amazingly enough. Unfortunately, I, didn't know that. I stayed in broadcasting. <laughs> 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 I was right after you, class of '77, or shortly after you. Um, but YBC, which was Yale's uh, uh, radio uh, station, um, it, it, but it's kind of not. Also, it's kind of it's independent, it independently run. Uh, had no sense of history, so there was no way I would have known who, who my predecessors uh, were. Did you want to be a, a DJ? I guess you worked in, in rock radio for a while. I did. Well, it was the 60s. I had no musical talent of my own, so playing records was the closest thing I could get to in rock and roll, and it was just fabulous, and I did it uh, in college and then professionally uh, at WHCN in Hartford for a oh, couple yeah. of years. It was it was really great, 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 great thing to do back then. Absolutely. If the Wikipedia article is right, and that's what I'm I'm cribbing this uh, from, you kind of drifted around with different things for a while. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. I was a teacher of transcendental meditation. Uh, I have a master's degree in counseling psychology. Uh, I worked in, in the psychiatric unit of a community hospital until I figured out how I could make a great contribution to human services, which was by getting out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but you and, had studied... Was, yeah. Go ahead. No, that was the summer that I bought my Apple II computer, ah. actually. I was unemployed. I, I, I took my meager savings and I, I plunked it down on this machine I was completely fascinated with, and that actually changed my life dramatically. Oh, well, you weren't alone in that. The, uh, the, when, when it went from, and of course, when you were uh, at, in college, as, wa as when I was in college, computing was a very different experience. It was a, you had to go down to the computer center. You had to use, use it in the middle of the night because everybody was using it in the daytime. And, you know, it was at punch cards. It was a very different punch experience. Yeah. yeah. Having well, a personal you know computer with a keyboard and display on your desk, people don't realize now what a revolution that was. That's right. No, that's, it, it has been forgotten. It's sort of like, cars for people who grew up with horses cars were like a miracle now you can't imagine a world without right. cars and it just seems pointless to talk about what a big deal it was when when, when cars <laughs> happened but, but computers were like that changed people's lives yeah so i understand anyway how the how getting that apple II completely changed your focus in your life oh, did you say i, I want to write software is that what you thought what did you think well, I had had a bunch of computer experience on mainframes, and um, I, I knew a little bit of programming, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with the Apple II, but the day after I bought it, this is a true story, I was hanging out in a computer store in Cambridge, Mass. I was unemployed. I had a lot of free time. I saw this guy buying an Apple II uh, well-dressed guy in a suit. I was eavesdropping on his conversation. And I walked up to him and I said, I'm a consultant and I think I can help you with the <laughs> problem. I, I, I really don't usually have that kind of chutzpah, but I was inspired. And I had my Apple II 24 hours longer than he had. So I figured <laughs> as long as I could stay ahead of him, he wouldn't be any wiser. And 
that was it, it's a true story that is how i i got started in I love it. I love it. You learned the magic word, consultant. <laughs> I did. And he was paying me, I think, uh, $7 an hour, which wow. even in 1978 was, <laughs> was not a lot of money. How did, but it was enough, enough to get started. How did, how did Lotus come about? Well, after I got this first consulting gig in 78 on the Apple II, I had this I was in my late twenties, incredibly intensive three year stint of consulting and starting my first software company and writing my first big program and uh, going out to Silicon Valley for six months and working for a startup. And it was uh, all a fabulous education. And out of that really came the idea for, uh, for doing Lotus. What was um, that? What was that first company, that first product? So the first product um, was, it was the first graphics and statistics package written, as far as I know, for the Apple II. Uh, and it was, uh, it was called Tiny Troll, T-R-O-L-L. Because -L. there was this uh, statistics time-sharing program at MIT called Troll. Ah. And so this was a, an infinitely small subset, but it did multiple regressions and there was a, a small but but real paying market for it. We charged people $100 for it and duplicated the disks ourselves as me and, and one partner. And uh, it was a start. Was it and written then, in an Apple Basic or? Yeah, it was written in Basic because that's what that's what there was. Well, that's, that's all what you I had to program it. Right, that's right. Right. Well, it was that or assembly language, and that was not not in my skill set to do a big program in assembly. Right. Language. 6502 or something. Yeah. So, First assembly language I learned, 6502. Yeah. So Not a sophisticated processor. In fact, I don't think it was designed to be a computer processor initially. Oh, well, it was an 8-bit, yeah, microcontroller that um, Steve Wozniak picked because it was inexpensive. It was cheap. Yeah. So that was the basis of that's the Apple how, That's PCs. how it happens. So when the IBM PC, did, it was, did Lotus predate the PC's release or? No. No, in fact the other way around, that we were working on what we wanted to do. And IBM announced the IBM PC, and I said, ah, this is the platform right. to put it on. Because it has IBM in the name, and it was a 16-bit processor. That was a big deal because Disacalc, which was an act of genius by Dan Berkman, the first spreadsheet, it was incredibly brilliant, but it was also limited to tiny spreadsheets because of the memory on the Apple II, which was 64 kilobytes. And, you know, there was a version of VisiCalc for the IBM PC from day one, but it inherited the architectural limitations. It didn't take advantage of the right. memory. I remember when the, the first VisiCalc came yeah. out on the PC. So, and you can download VisiCalc today, and it's like 32K. It's, it's tiny. Yeah, it's, it's tiny. It's, it's, <laughs> We've works. had, by the way, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston have both been on this yeah. show. So this is perfect. We're moving through history in the right chronological order. Well, and it, it, it started a revolution. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was it, the first killer app. It was something that a killer app is an application so good you bought a computer to run it. That's right. And the second and killer app was Lotus 123. And so we were terribly frightened of VisiCalc. I mean, it had, it was the, 500 pound gorilla, 300,000 units had been sold at the time we came into the market. Wow. And what I didn't understand was how big the potential market for productivity tools was, you know, tens of millions of units. And Lotus just tapped into that with a product that was just optimized for the IBM PC. And and so, you know, our first year we did $50 million in sales. And Wait a minute, brand new, brand new company, first year, $50 million in sales. Yes, 1983, 30 years ago. The PC was two years old. That's right. So it was, no, it, it made, uh, it, it, it caused the PC industry to take off you know, in, in business, that product. It was, that's the killer app. That's right. And then, and businesses who were wondering, well, does a personal computer have anything anything to do in our business, said, wait a minute, Lotus 1, 2, 3, look at the, what we can do. We could do projections, we could do spreadsheets. Um, 
Were you? Yeah. How? How? But you were obviously influenced pr fairly heavily by uh, VisiCalc, right? I mean, were you trying Absolutely. to make a VisiCalc clone? No, not at all. Oh, okay. Um, I thought VisiCalc was brilliant. I had a set of ideas about what the what should come next, and I actually originally I went to the VisiCalc guys to try to work with them on that, and that they weren't interested. So. John Sachs and I did it ourselves, but we said we need to add graphing to it. So one button, make a graph out of Oh, that's sheet. right. What a revolution it, that was. Yeah. We need to um, take full advantage of the, the memory space, the 640K, so big spreadsheets, which you couldn't do with this calc. We used, uh, we had a much friendlier user interface. This calc interface was kind of cryptic. It used single letter command. Slash key. We, yeah, we had full full menus and, and long prompts in the menus and a help system uh, and a tutorial. And really the killer feature was the macros that we let mm -hmm. people who were non-programmers write code to re uh, automate repetitive things in the spreadsheet. And uh, so it just went a full generation past anything that had been there. And Did that was... Did Sachs do the co most of the coding, and you and you did the design? How did that work? He did all the coding uh, and the technical architecture. Mm -hmm. in, in modern day parlance, though, I was the, the product manager and the UX designer. Nice, and a nice job too. The user interface on Lotus One Two Three. I think there's a lot of people like me that still have the keystrokes in our <laughs> yeah. built into our, our muscle our, memory. Yeah. Muscle memory, exactly. Uh, there's the there's the launch okay, screen for Lotus One Two Three. Yep, yep. Isn't that great? Somebody's posted that in our chat room. Okay. People re people remember it with uh, uh, great fondness, you know. Uh, and you know, you think about what you innovated. Microsoft Excel really uh, did just took that and moved it into a, a GUI. Did you? What did you think about the move to Windows and the move to a GUI? I know Lotus uh, briefly did try it, flirted with that. So I was a. Uh bystander because I left Lotus in 87. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I didn't have a hand in what happened, but Lotus made the wrong bet. It bet on IBM's OS2, not on Windows. Uh, and that yeah. was the wrong bet to make. I can understand why, because it was helping its arch rival Microsoft. Of course, Microsoft knew that, but right. by not having a, a viable product in the Windows space, it just let Microsoft come in with Excel. They had no competition. You could, you, you know, you, you know, in hindsight, of course, uh, that that was a mistake. But from a technical point of view, I think it made a lot of sense to go with OS2. Who knew that that wasn't going to become a dominant operating yeah, system? Yeah, I was betting as much as I hated it. I would have bet on Windows because IBM really didn't have the business savvy to go right. make OS2 work in, in, in the broad marketplace. It wasn't, wasn't their core competency. They, they were good with big enterprise customers, right. but not the consumer market. And well, so, you're, you're right on on that. Uh, no, my, yeah, Microsoft was clearly the company that Destiny was going to favor yep. and did. So uh, wrapping up, uh, Lotus 123 gave you the opportunity to get some time, an opportunity to uh, do some other things. Uh, in 1990, just a couple of years later, you, John Perry Barlow, and John Gilmore uh, started the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Yeah, that was uh, little did we know. <laughs> Brilliant, huh? Uh, well, look, I've always been early uh, on things. It's my only skill is is, is spotting important trends early. Not and a bad, not a bad single skill to have, bit, Mitch. <laughs> no, exactly. I'm not complaining. If you're going to pick um, one, it's it's better than. <laughs> turning bunnies into true. snakes or something. I mean. That's right. <laughs> but 1990 was pre-commercial internet. Right. Certainly pre-browser, pre-web. Right. The internet, the government was just, just starting to think about loosening access to let other people onto it besides Researchers. Because it was NS, NSF owned it, the backbones, National yeah, Science Foundation. Right. And, 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 and so you could kind of get on. Uh, there was this co community bulletin board called The Well the in well. San Francisco yep. that I was a member of and met lots of interesting people. It's probably how you met John, right? John Gilmore. It is how I met John. Yeah. Both Johns. I remember and, they were both very active on The Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and there were kids 
who were hacking into networks, even then, what, what few there were. Um, uh, and the well was my first experience of the internet because it's a message board and it's not the internet, it's a closed space. But you could drop out of the well UI to a command line. Intentionally, they set that up. Yeah. And from there, you could launch Archie or Gopher, and you could suddenly you're on the internet. And I remember even then, even in the very early 90s, this sense of, my God, the world, it, the, the globe just opened up. Yeah. Was, yeah, it was, was palpable. But there was, but we're not talking browsers here. This was, no, no. This was geeks. FTP, file transfer yeah. protocol, and, and other protocols long since, <laughs> long since forgotten. But yeah. you, could, you, you, could, you could reach out. And, and get information and talk to other people. It's um, funny how much the well comes up in these conversations. Well, it was it was seminal and it was mind blowing. It was an LSD kind of experience to be in a virtual community. It felt real. Yeah. But you were not physically proximate, and that had never happened in history. It was uh, I think started by Stuart Brand, who had done the Whole Stuart Earth Brand. catalog, and it was yes. it stood stood for the uh, Whole Earth Electronic Link, something like that. Yes. Exactly. And uh, it was, a, you know, anybody who's used uh, a message board system today is familiar with it in its fundamental uh, shape. But it was just text oriented. People tended to have very short three or four letter, uh, I think with three letter handles in many cases. Yeah. And the flame, initially it felt like a garden. It was famous, though, for some of its flame wars. It had all of the dynamics that. Are, we, we now have writ large on, on the yeah. internet. There can be incredibly engaging conversations and then horrible interchanges, yeah. you know, randomly interspersed. Um, <laughs> sort of, that's Reddit. I mean, Reddit is, Reddit. Like, well, yeah. only a billion times larger. Yeah. Um, so you're asking about EFF. One of the topics of discussion on EFF was the fact that Secret Service and other agencies were busting hackers and locking them up and throwing away the key. Wow. And this seems wrong in the sense of being incredibly disproportionate because at that time you didn't have criminals, syndicates, and these were kids who were basically trespassing and, right. and maybe spray painting some graffiti digitally. But really, really not worse than that, and we're facing felony charges and long prison sentences. And we saw this as a civil liberties issue. And it was one, it was just out of ignorance. All this was new. All this computer networking was new and law enforcement was not familiar with it and was making mistakes. And we started EFF to make the case that civil liberties protected under the, under the, you know, the Bill of Rights extended into cyberspace. I mean, as long as you're doing it from the U.S. And we were actually very successful in initially in raising consciousness and in getting issues reframed and in really um, establishing basic protections. And, and, you know, EFF has gone on and now plays a very important role in a very different ecosystem that's big and... <laughs> The world's economy well, depends on. And ironically, we're still fighting that battle of hackers being yes. treated as um, massive criminals. And you look at somebody like Aaron Schwartz, uh, it, it's still happening. It is still happening. What I would also say, though, is that the bad guys have long since discovered the Internet, are on it, are using it. Every bad thing that individuals and groups of people do, they now do in and on and through and with the internet. Oh yeah. And so there are very significant policy issues about how what, what we do about all that without becoming uh, totalitarian. So actually, I probably, while well, I'm a uh, sympathetic to and an advisor to EFF and continue to support it, I find myself sometimes much more divided and torn. Uh, I'm not a, a pure a pure play civil libertarian because I understand the needs of governments to uh, help maintain order. Well, and it's a mess. And it is a mess. is a mess. It's a, it's and a it's mess. that's how it is. It's anarchic. It's the nature of the internet. So um, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I just have a different perspective. Twenty years later. Well, and John Perry Barlow has talked a little bit about kind of dis, kind of this 
tension in, even on the board of EFF uh, between people who say no government intervention at all and those who say there's a place for the government. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. It is a hard problem. It's sort of we, the genie is out of the bottle and it's not going to go back in. Yeah. But at the same time, the Internet's current architecture and the practices are responsible for lots of problems we don't have or amplifying lots of problems. It's people who cause the problems. Of course. It's like guns don't kill people. people right, kill right. People. But <laughs> I'm an advocate of gun control and I'm an advocate of having some rational and pragmatic ways of uh, addressing the problems of bad things that happen in and through networks. The other thing that is a thread throughout your uh, uh, life now is open source software, or very early on a big supporter of open source software. Yeah. Which is interesting because you made, you made your, uh, your, your big hit with a closed source program. Yeah, well, that's what there was at the time. Right. And I have to say that... Um, my first experience with open source was post Lotus. Well, I was still, it was still there, but we were already had our own building and we're, we're, we're quite successful. And we were picketed by Richard Stallman. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, free, it was my <laughs> free, yeah, software free software foundation, foundation yeah. and, and really the father of GNU and, uh, and of, yeah, yeah, the father of open source. Well, he, 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 yeah, he wrote yeah, Emacs. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, really is the father of open source. Although, do you think, had there been open source, though, that you would have said Lotus 1, 2, 3 should be an open source project? Probably not. No. Um, but if I'd grown up in a culture where open source was important, an important part of the ecosystem, I think my business would have supported and reflected it. Yes. Say more like Google. Google guys, right. unlike Bill Gates, came of age when there was already an right. internet. And they understand, they, they would never, for instance, want to do something to sort of close or control the internet. I mean, they wouldn't have a business. Right. Whereas Microsoft coming a decade, two decades earlier, before there was an internet, actually tried to do a set of proprietary protocols for wide area communication, I mean that lost terribly to, to Bob, the internet. Bob Frankston was a was there and try, and kind of undermined the whole thing. Yeah. But but um, so no, I think it's progress actually consists of the fact, in, in part, that things like open source find their way into the world and become part of the environment. The internet is built uh, on it and. The commercial world learns to coexist with it in, you know, interesting and useful and, and, and healthy kinds of ways. You know, so. that's really interesting. I never thought about it. And part of it is because this is moving so much faster than the normal course of humor and events. But, you, but, but a business model designed 10 years ago doesn't make sense in the, in the modern world of the Internet. You, you really have to shift your whole – a company like Google now is even starting to look old school compared to maybe what's going to happen in the next few years. That's right. So that that's why there's a place for venture capital and, and angel investors, because the whole software stack in, in every market gets completely redone, you know, every what decade. Unbelievable. So. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> just, just keeps going. And now everything is being done, redone for mobile and cloud. Yeah. And um, it's it's interesting. So you say mm -hmm. your skill is, is being able to see ahead. And I, if when I look at your CV, it's obvious you're very, very good at that. In 2003, you, you were uh, first chair of the Mozilla Foundation when Netscape bought the code. They open sourced it. They gave it away. And, uh, and for many years, Mozilla was often seen as a failed example of open source. Well, it was a failed example, and then it became a successful example. So, <laughs> it was failed until it made it. <laughs> well, because uh, Firefox was... Uh, an offshooter was a that's right a side a side project that was not well regarded inside Mozilla. Isn't that interesting? Until it took over the world, in which case everybody said, "Oh yeah, no, we were we <laughs> liked this all, all along." Yeah, so, people forget Mozilla was a suite. I mean, it had yeah. a whole bunch. There was Composer, and there was all this stuff, Thunderbird, right. which, all this stuff. Right. Which is not what people wanted. They wanted a uh, just a browser. Thank you. 
yeah. that was not Internet Explorer. Right. That was the other thing that at the point where Firefox took off, it, it was sort of the trough of Internet Explorer. It didn't work well. It was buggy. It was right. slow. It had all. It was insecure, and so Microsoft was not investing in it. So uh, there was really an opportunity. I mean, having Microsoft having vanquished Netscape saw no need to continue right. to innovate in the browsing space. So. And, and that happened in 1996. It, does it feel like a whirlwind? I mean, do you feel like this stuff is going boom, 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 boom? Or do you see it a, a kind of logical, steady path? Oh, no, no. I think it's uh, kind of punctuated equilibrium where yeah. there are yeah, yeah. In, immense disruptions that happen in short periods of time and then things settle down until the next set of disruptions. But what I will say is what we've been talking about is really ancient history to people in their 20s who are building the next generation of Oh, things. I know. I have to explain this so that they can understand what this me but it's not ancient history it's a it's a couple of decades ago a decade that's ago. right and it's also the hidden advantage competitive advantage for people who live through it we're not as smart uh, as or as fast as those youngsters digital natives <laughs> uh it, it's just you know you get old you lose your moves but on the other hand <laughs> we're the wily maybe, we're the wily yeah. veterans satchel page of, uh, <laughs> right of, of tech and I you know so when Facebook announced this platform a few years ago and it was such a big deal and everybody was so enthusiastic about it I was very cautious because I lived through what Microsoft did with its platform which is they kind of did a lot in the early years to get people to build on top of it and then they did things in the later years to really control it and shut people out to move in their own apps and I think it's sort of a logic of how you build yeah. dominant platforms. You don't have to be evil to, to do that. It's just sort of the way it works. And I was talking about that, and people thought, the 20 something, this is in 2008, thought I was like, they found it incomprehensible until like, you know, the last year. In which, and I get emails from people. I said, you gave this talk. I found it. How did you know? And, and I explained to them, well, it's sort of like, the movie Psycho, you know, first Hitchcock made it in the 60s, but much more recently it was remade shot for shot by Gus Van Zandt. And if you went in and you saw the new Psycho and you didn't know it had ever been made before and you're sitting next to me, I'm saying, no, no, that lady, she should not go in the shower. Something really bad is this. don't go in the shower. And, you know, and she gets all hacked up and stabbed in the shower. And my seatmate says, how did you know that? And I said, well, I've seen the movie. We've seen this movie, movie before. before? Yeah. So, I, you know, it's, I mean. But you're not, okay, one. you're not, per okay, I'm going to find a flaw, bitch, because you're. I've, you, Let's you, talk about my flaws. Your flaws, Linden Labs. Now, maybe yeah. you don't consider that a flaw, but you were one of the one of the founders of uh, and, and served on the board, uh, chairman of the board, yeah. I think, yeah. of yeah. Uh, Second Life. Yes. Now, I can't blame you because everybody, myself included, thought that these virtual worlds were the next big thing. Yeah. Well, so it's been a partial success. So first of all, one thing people don't know is that Second Life is still going. It's like a 70, 80 million dollar year business. The user to user economy is still half a billion dollars a year. Uh, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of, of daily users. It's not like it's gone away, but what it has done is that the growth has absolutely flattened out and uh, it, it, it isn't really in and of itself going anywhere. It sort of reached the limits of what it could do with that user interface and that technology stack, and it's going to be stuck there. But I think virtual worlds will come back in a Absolutely. new incarnation. It may be Linden, it may not be Linden. Right. And so, you know, it's one of these, it, it's kind of like DOS uh, without the windows, you know? <laughs> right. DOS was a very big deal as an operating system. Oh, yeah. But it wasn't going to take over the whole world. It was too hard, too cryptic, too limited. Uh, it needed a graphical user interface. It needed Windows and the Mac. Uh, and we don't have that yet for virtual worlds. Linden Lab, Second Life is the boss of virtual world. Right. And I, you know, I, it's, I it's actually it not the DOS. It's more like the Windows 3.0 because there have been, I can remember, avatar based chats. There have been all sorts of attempts at this. Ever, ever since Neil Stevenson uh, wrote sure. Snow Crash and talked about the metaverse, people have wanted to go into a virtual world. 
Right. Well, we should argue that I would say those things are sort of the CPMs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, I mean, obscure historical Good enough. Reference. Good but, enough. <laughs> and, and the people, the Second Life residents, hate me whenever I say anything because it's always the wrong thing. Because they think I'm making fun or limiting them, and I'm just I'm I'm no, no. resigned. Yeah. Resigned to that. No, and but um, and, 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 and uh, look, any but any uh, technology that has its adherence, if you say anything that isn't negative about the technology, but just say, hey, look, it's not going to be the next big thing, they they feel betrayed. But as you said, we've seen this movie before. I think about Microsoft uh, loving tablets for ten years uh, mm -hmm. with, with no success at all, and all of a sudden Apple comes along and tablets are the next big thing. And I'm sure. sh I completely convinced uh, with you that at some point, and I hope it's before. Uh, my uh, end times, uh, we will be able to enter uh, virtual worlds and we'll feel immersed in them and uh, be able to interact with them in the same way that we do the real world. Well, you know, Philip Rosedale, who started Second Life, has a new company called High Fidelity that's still fairly stealthy, but they've said that they're working on next generation virtual reality. Mm. So, well, with the Oculus not, Rift, you, know. you, yeah, got yeah. The, and, mm -hmm. you got to the, the technology's hardware. catching up. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll see interesting things. So yeah, so Linden is not in terms of next big thing isn't uh isn't 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 huge, but for, it's, for, it's also not dead. I thought you were gonna mention Chandler. I you that. know what that's next. And you know, Chandler was, is a really interesting yeah. story that yeah. no one knows. But Good. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I was very excited. This was an open source project to create yeah. Uh, a I, at at the time, PIMs were big, personal information yes. managers. I don't e we don't even use the word PIM anymore. But uh, yeah, I was trying to be a replacement for Outlook and Exchange, but also have the spirit of Lotus Agenda, which is this product they did 20 years ago. That was a freeform information manager that had a a a, a small but very dedicated cult following that really led you organize the contents of, of, of your brain. And I so, remember reading that Mitch Kapoor was working on the ultimate open source PIM. Yeah. At the time, yeah. Linux didn't really have a very good right. Outlook replacement. And I was so excited. I know the whole world was, the whole Linux using world was. Um, what happened? It was too ambitious. It yeah. was sort of a victim of um, over ambition and me not having a sense of my own limits, uh, but having the ability to write checks to support the thing for quite a long time. So one of the dangers of self-funded projects is they lack kinds of checks and balances to say, hey, this really isn't working and we're not going to keep supporting it. Um, so well-intentioned, great people, the, the only actual thing of value that came out of it is is CalDAV, which is the exchange oh, protocol that's used to share and synchronize calendars. That that was part and of. Cal CalDAV is critical to Google calendars. Apple uses yeah. it, although Microsoft yeah. and Google are fighting over it. I guess Google's abandoning it. Yeah. So, which is a shame. Uh, it was. Very much not a lean startup, <laughs> yeah. what we were trying to do. Too many people uh, trying to do too much. And it was also for people who are interested in it, there's a quite a good book documenting it that's written sympathetically but critically called Dreaming in Code by Scott Rosenberg. Wonderful. We have an indebted uh, journalist. It was so educational for me because since then, in all the projects I backed as a seed stage, tech investor and now an impact investor, um, the focus on taking things in small steps and uh, really adhering to the core spirit of lean startup, of minimal viable product and uh, things like that. I've really taken that to heart and it's worked incredibly well. I'm a true believer in it. And if I hadn't gone through the pain of of Chandler not working, I don't think I would have taken the lessons to heart as much. Well, in fact, uh, every entrepreneur I talk to has has a Chandler. Uh, yeah, somewhere in there. <laughs> somewhere in there. But you need to learn that. In fact, Scott's uh, subtitle for the book, Dreaming and Code, kind of says it all. 
uh, two dozen programmers, three years, 4,732 bugs, and one quest for transcendent software. Yeah. And, and the only reason I remember Chandler is because I, I was disappointed. I was really looking forward to it. Yeah, no, we disappointed a lot of people, which is another important lesson. Just kind of uh, be careful about that kind of stuff. Well, I don't want to make you feel bad. <laughs> no, 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 I don't know. It's actually, uh, as I said, educational in the best sense that while very, very painful, uh, I think I and others came out of it um, really having learned some pretty deep lessons. Yeah. So you say you're an impact investor. What is that? Well, so it's the idea of investments having a double bottom line, that they should simultaneously create both economic value but also social value. So, for instance, in education, to be ed tech, to be very concrete, we look at uh, closing gaps in uh, access and achievement. Like if there's some math, uh, supplemental, you know, online curriculum, we say, is this being done in a way that if the company succeeds, it's actually going to close the achievement gap between the low income and higher income populations? Because we think that's a good thing to do. We think technology can help. Uh, and that would be an impact, a positive social impact investment uh, to do that. So so we look tell me about some of your uh, impact investments. Um, okay. So a bunch of things in education. Uh, one that we've done. Boy, education's begging to be yeah. uh, reinvented, isn't it? Well, education and healthcare are areas oh, yeah. that, you know, our society is dependent on. They've been, relatively speaking, um, underinvested in terms of really good uh, uh, tech, you know, information technology. So one instance is a, a company called um, Asmapolis, Asthma, Asmapolis. And they make a little wireless sensor that sits on top of an emergency asthma inhaler. So if you use your emergency inhaler and you're asthmatic, you're trying to stave off an attack. And it sends, every time you use one of these gizmos it sends a little message up into the cloud it can alert your healthcare provider it can send you a reminder to take your your medication uh it's it's pretty simple tech but what they found is oh there you go is that it actually reduces trips to the emergency room and rehospitalization just because there's more awareness and you can you can cut off somebody going out of control stop yourself from going out of control before you wind up in the ER, and that's very expensive and bad for your health. So it actually produces better health outcomes and reduces healthcare costs. So that's an impact investment in, uh, you know, in, 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 in the health space. This is cool. Uh, so it's both, it's a hardware device that goes on the inhaler, but then there's an iPhone app and there's a web page. There's a whole, there's a whole set of stuff, and it goes out through, um, you know, healthcare systems provide it uh, for free to their clients because it actually saves the healthcare system money. So, and there are, you know, uh, quite a few opportunities um, like that. We're looking in education at something in bilingual education for English language learners where the government allocates a lot of money already to uh, some dedicated funds. Uh, but there isn't an online curriculum that is both pedagogically terrific and culturally highly relevant. Uh, no one had just gone and made it. And we found this wonderful Latina entrepreneurs who had done this, and we're you know backing uh, backing them. Uh, and it's you know it's in pilot now, but uh, really in terms of helping. Um, uh, kids who come to the country uh, who, who don't speak English really learn English and you know be in the mainstream in schools and and therefore have an opportunity to uh, you know make something of their lives not, and not be marginalized. Boy, that's a that's a great thing to do. So it must be fun. You must be enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, it sounds it like is. fun. It, it it is fun and it feels meaningful. And we see a lot of entrepreneurs who have been successful in tech. When they do their second startup, they say, I, look, I did this advertising network, nothing wrong with that, but I don't want to do that. I want to do something that makes a difference. I want to help 
deliver, do something. I want to do web van, but without losing a billion dollars building. <laughs> <idea>. <laughs> uh, there, there's an interesting company called Good Eggs, started by ex-Google guys, that is working on local, uh, local healthy foods, both uh, raw food and prepared food that can be delivered same day to you. Uh, but doing it with like Uber style logistics, meaning don't spend a billion dollars on some plan do it without actually having to, you know, invest in, um, do it in a way that the economics work, which they never did for web dance. And I think that's, that's super smart. And they're very committed every time they go into a high income community neighborhood, you know, like Pacific Heights in San Francisco, where I used to live before I moved to Oakland, they also set it up. Uh, so that it is serving, uh, you know, a lower income community uh, on, on the other side of the bay. Uh, because they want the benefits of the tech to be broadly distributed. So that's, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I'll tell you another, one other impact. You know, we consider it to be an impact investment is Uber itself. Love Uber. Uber is a job creation machine because it takes drivers, and these are typically all immigrants, who have been working hourly for somebody else, uh, and it lets them operate their own independent business by being an Uber driver. And if they're and if they have initiative and, and work hard, I mean, it's, it's created many thousands of jobs already. And job creation, uh, it's 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 super important. But you so, talk to the taxi commissions in many cities, including D.C. and Toronto, and. All of, they are not happy about Uber because they feel like the, the, they've, they've got a medallion system and you guys are completely uh, uh, bypassing this entrenched bureaucratic system they've got. I think the battle is over there, though, because... It is. You won a big, didn't you want a big victory this in, recently? In, yeah, in East Coast cities in uh, uh, D.C. And, and Boston. And uh, this is the way the world is going now. And so the taxi commissions are fighting a, a rear guard action that isn't, I mean, there, it, 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 there's a lot of mopping up to do, but there's only one outcome here. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, you know, it's better, it's more convenient, it's safer. Uh, I love available. it. We, we took yeah. Uber in uh, Paris for the first time at Le Web last year when you launched in Paris, and it was wonderful. It's, it, it, it's great. And they're now multiple classes of services. So it just started out as car service, but now there's, you know, a, a, a taxi level and, and the company has actually said it's going to go into the ride share market also in those cities where uh, it's, where there's, where the regulators have said ride sharing is okay. Yeah. Avis just bought Zap car, right? So, uh, or no, city share, one of those. Yeah. There's been consolidation already. Yeah. In that. I mean, urban transportation is, well, that's another one rapid. ripe for reinvention. Yeah, is. Well, driverless cars. And yeah. who would have thought? Because a bunch of experts have said, you know, 15 years ago, there'll never be driverless cars. It's too hard a problem. Technically. They were solving the wrong problem. They thought they had to build new roads. Yeah, that's right. That's right. This is like amazing. I right, lots of credit to Google on, on pushing all this. Yeah. It's very important. Yeah, these cars are remarkable. All right, so uh, we got a few minutes left. What do you think going forward? Uh, if you were, uh, if you had some in money to impact invest, or even not impact invest, what, what I mean, obviously mobile is happening, um, but what else? What do you, what do you, what exciting trends do you see out there? Well, here, so here, here's a trend that I see: um, uh, chess. Not that chess is the trend, but chess playing the best chess player in the world is not a machine and it's not a person. It's a team of people and machines. And the people by themselves aren't grandmasters and the machines by themselves aren't the best standalone chess players, but it's the hybrid. And I think these hybrid systems that take the best of what computers could do and use the best of human creativity, intelligence and judgment, that's going to be a very big deal, particularly in education. Uh, but I also think in healthcare and in other areas, so, yeah. so it's not that we're getting better chess players, but what you're saying is this human machine yeah. mix where you have the intuitive, uh, synthetic abilities of a human yeah. combined with the vast speed and databases of a machine yeah. can create something new. And better than what you could do with either one alone. 
So I think that's going to be a trend in, in systems that, that, uh, that do that well. And I think we're going to see some in, in education. They're going to use the computers to do routine, patient, step-by-step online instruction with students. Right. But use teachers, pull the teachers in as coaches to help get kids really unstuck uh, and to do the kinds of things that you really want to do with people in a you know, face-to-face kind of way. To leveraging the precious resources. Clearly, we we have to reinvent education, and a lot of attention is paid on uh, to higher education because, yeah. as everybody talks about now, it's so expensive and there's such a burden of debt. You, there's really no, yeah. no financial justification for going to college. But of course, where you're going to make the greatest difference is in lower education. You bet. Well, I'm probably even in preschool. Preschool. You know? Wow. Uh, well, the earlier, and 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 it's a complicated issue. How to use tech. Uh, every time I see an 18-month-old in front of an iPad, I shudder slightly. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. But, yeah. but the earlier you can intervene, right? Uh, the more powerful the effect is going to be. And certainly K-12, everybody agrees that the model of classrooms that we have today, which is inherited from the late 19th century, is obsolete. But we don't exactly know what is going to right. replace it. Right, right. So, right, and we've seen some spectacular... Uh, fail- failures like Chris Whittle's sure. attempt to create for-profit uh, public education. That's right. In for-profit K-12, probably not a great idea. No. But charter schools, on the other hand, which were very unpopular with progressives when they first came out, have really demonstrated that innovation can happen if you're willing to let little experiments, yes. standalone experiments, flourish and if you don't permit that to happen you don't get the innovation now the problem is okay successful innovations in a variety of different charter schools how do you get scale Mm. big problem how do you import those changes back so that an entire urban public school system benefits across the board that's a systems change problem hard problem people are working on mitch it's so it's so great that uh that you are in this world. <laughs> I don't know how to put it any other way. Oh, you're too kind. Thank <laughs> but you've made such a huge contribution in so many areas, and you continue to. And, uh, you know, I've just touched on a few of them, and I think anybody watching goes, wow, oh, he did that. Oh, wow, he did that. Oh, he did that. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. just it's really exciting. And I'm glad to see also that people like us in our uh, – Later, he is over 50, <laughs> uh, uh, card-holding members of the AARP have something to contribute uh, to this revolution. Yeah, no, we're not, uh, um, we're not completely obsolete yet by any means. <laughs> We've seen this movie, and we, and we can tell you the plot. <laughs> right, right. Don't go in the shower. Do not <laughs> go in the shower. <laughs> Been there, done that. Do not go into the shower. Mitch, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. I hope, I know you have a place up in the north there, and uh, it's right off 101 on the way. If you ever want to stop at the Twit Brick House, we'd love to have you in studio. We, we go we go right past uh, where you are, and so, all right, we'll, we'll make it. Day. We'll make it. We'll, make, we'll do it on a weekend when it's on your way. Consider it done. Thank you. Mitch Kapor, everybody. Right. Thank you. What Thank a great you. way to all celebrate right. our 100th episode. Thank you, Mitch. Take care. And Thanks. And uh, and if you want to know more, of course, uh, I think it's pretty easy to find uh, Mitch Kapoor's uh, website. And, uh, the, you know, there's a lot more to, to know about Mitch. Just a fascinating uh, guy. We do this show every uh, Wednesday. And each and every time, I'm just blown away by the quality of guests. And kudos to Karsten Bondi, who's been producing the show for the last few months and has got some great guests. We did have next week... Uh, we had a reschedule. It was Doug Rushkoff was going to be on? I was. I'm very excited about talking to Doug, but uh, so it's a mystery next week. But we have some wonderful people on the agenda going forward. Uh, these are, I think, you know, in some ways, uh, what I think we're doing is making historical records of uh, uh, the people who are really thinking and changing the world. And I'm so glad that uh, you could join us. If you if you like to come back every Wednesday about four o'clock Pacific, seven p.m. Eastern time that's uh, 2400 right at midnight utc uh or if you can't watch live and i do appreciate it when you do because i love the chat room and the feedback you give me and the suggestions for questions uh you can always watch after the fact we make on-demand audio and video available at twit.tv slash t-r-i or you can get it each and every week automatically if you just subscribe on one of the 
podcatchers, the podcast aggregators like iTunes. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you next week on Triangulation.